Um, <coughs> thought I'd start a long way back. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to play a lot of Lego. And, you know, maybe I'm sort of just mildly Aspergerish or something, but, you know, a lot of Lego. And, and this was back in the 60s and early 70s, where you didn't have all these different bit, yeah, Lego bits, right? I, all I remember is basically red block, blocks and green blocks. And all the things you could build out of red blocks, blocks and, and green blocks. And, uh, that, the relevance of that, I think, will become clear in a, in a, in a moment. Uh, I didn't know at the time, understandably, uh, that um, around that time there was a fellow who was working um, on really one of the most interesting projects of the 20th century. Uh, and that, or indeed the 21st century, uh, a fellow called Douglas Engelbart. Anybody recognise that name? Douglas no, Engelbart. I have actually met him and had a chat. Uh, good yeah. um, in 1962, uh, the year I was born, actually in the late 50s, this fellow, Douglas Engelbart, smart young en engineer, um, <clears throat> he'd graduated and he thought, what am I going to do with my life? And he, as he relates it, he was driving down a highway somewhere in California and he thought, you know, there are some really serious problems the world's got. And, you know, late 50s, you can imagine um, the sort of problems he had in mind. There were some really serious problems. If we don't fix these problems, you know, we're cactus. And, and I think, yeah. 50 years later, we're in the same position. How are we going to solve those problems? It was obvious to, to Douglas Engelbart that we didn't have the tools. We didn't have the mental power to be able to adequately cope with the complexity of the problems that we were confronting. And he thought, we've got to find a better way to leverage human intelligence. Okay. So he wasn't going down the AI path. We've got to build computers that can think for us. He was going down the IA path, which is the intelligence, intelligence augmentation path. How can we make ourselves smarter? Because we're obviously not smart enough. You know, we're not smart enough to avoid the Second World War, for example. Uh, so how can we make ourselves smarter? Intelligence augmentation. In 1962, the year I was born, he wrote a report. Uh, could we just flick over to the uh, next slide, thanks. Uh, called Augmenting Human Intellect, a Conceptual Framework. And uh, this is Jeff, this, sorry, this is um, Douglas Engelbert, uh, back in sort of that period. Summary, this is an initial summary of a report of a project taking a new and systematic approach to improving the intellectual effectiveness of the individual human being. A detailed conceptual framework explores the nature of the system composed of the individual and the tools. On the one hand, you know, a person and the tools the person works with. Concepts and methods that match his basic capabilities to his problems. One of the tools sh that shows the greatest immediate promise is the computer. When it can be harnessed for direct online assistance integrated with new concepts and methods. Of course, he didn't mean online as in on the internet, because there wasn't the internet at that time. Um, and indeed, there was hardly even computers at that time, in 1962. Uh, now, if you want really a kind of a, kind of, well, it's cliche, but I say mind-blowing, you know, sort of insight into um, the, the kind of prescience of this man, right? just read this report. It's, 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 it's a little bit hard to read because it's, he's using some, from what, from our perspective, is now slightly archaic language. But uh, he's predicting then what we're all doing now. And I'll just give you just a glimpse of that, if we can flick to the next. Uh, uh, it's a quote from the report. To, to help us get better comprehension of the structure of an argument, we can also call for a schematic or graphical display. Once the antecedent consequent links have been established, the computer can automatically construct such a display for us. So Joe spent a few minutes, with your help, establishing a reasonable set of links among the statements you had originally listed. Then another, another keyed in request to the computer, and almost instantaneously there appeared a network of lines and dots that looked something like a tree. Not exactly a tree, it's important. Except that sometimes branches were fused together. Each node or dot represents one of the statements of your argument, and the lines are antecedent consequent links. 
the antecedents of one statement always lie above that statement, or rather their nodes lie above its node. When you get used to a network representation like this, it really becomes a great help in getting the feel for the way all the different ideas and reasoning fit together. That is, for the conceptual structuring. Now, imagine how that sounded in 1962, where there just weren't schematic and graphical displays that could be automatically assembled for you. Never existed. But he was imagining it, he, could, he was foreseeing it. What he's describing there is argument mapping that 40 to 50 years later actually came into existence. He's describing it almost exactly. Uh, so what is argument mapping? It is the schematic or graphical representation of argumentation. I want to just say a few words about why we need that. Uh, come on, and go to the next. Uh, this is an argument map argument diagram, argument schema from the early 20th century by a fellow called Wigmore. Uh, it was developed in kind of legal uh, um, scholarship uh, as a representation of reasoning in a complex legal case. You can see why it never took off. Not a very appealing diagram. But, but, I, but I'm thinking that, that Engelbart had that sort of a diagram in mind. He's saying, look, the computer could automatically assemble this for us. Uh, <coughs> well, yes, yeah, it's not very appealing as it stands, but in some ways it's better than the alternative. And I want to represent for a moment, get to think about the alternative. How do we handle, how do we represent arguments normally? When the last time you encountered a really complex argument, in what form was it represented? Text. In text, in a book, in a speech, in an opinion piece in the newspaper, in text, in prose. Okay? Think about, let's think about for a moment about prose. Yeah, could go to the next one. Uh, this is a piece of prose. It's not very elegant prose, but Pentonville Road runs from east to west, then turns into City Road, which comes to a T-junction where East Road meets Moorgate City Road, running roughly south from Pentonville Road, his first crazy road, and then King's Cross Road. Da, 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 da. It goes on and on and on. Uh, what is this? Any idea? Small part of London. True. <laughs> Indeed, small part of London. Uh, it's a description of the streets and how they interconnect. All right, now here's a question for you. How do you get, next slide, how do you get from St Paul's Cathedral to London Museum? Come on. Walk. Very, yeah, how do you walk? Which streets, you know? Uh, Okay, I can see sort of nobody is really trying hard here because you know how hard it would be. You know it would be possible, but it would take a lot of effort to figure it out and not a very interesting intellectual challenge to do that figuring out. Um, if I go to the next slide. Oh, St Paul's Cathedral, London Museum, just down the street. Right, walk one block. Walk north one block there, and you're there. Now, what I want to underscore is how dramatically easier it was to answer the question when we had the map as opposed to the prose. The prose, in fact, was just the, the map. I, I took that map, literally, and transcribed. I, I described every street and what it connected to and it, into prose. Right? Why did I do it? Because I was feeling perverse and <laughs> I wanted to illustrate a point. It's a completely stupid thing to do. Why would you do that? We already have a good representation. This is well suited to our cognitive capacities. The other one isn't. Okay. Now you can see where I'm going. Right? What about arguments? Well, arguments are complicated. Arguments, you know, argumentation, complex debates, they're really complex, just like streets in London are really complex. And yet we represent it in prose. And it's you know, very easy to see that act, that actually makes it very hard for us to follow what's going on. Not impossible but very hard. So, so the obvious idea is, well, why don't we do what, what maps do for arguments? Why, why does this work? Because it takes advantage of colour. It takes advantage of position in space. It takes advantage of shape. It takes advantage of, of distance and icons. And Why wouldn't you? If you have all those resources for representing things, why wouldn't you use them for representing arguments? Why do we persist in a technology that's thousands of years old. Sure, yeah, sure. yeah, sure. Well, one of the reasons, it seems to me, is that arguments are not just intellectual. 
they're not just cognitive, they're also emotional. It's as if you're going from St Paul's Cathedral to London Museum, but along that street there is the sewer underneath that uh, has a, a, a yeah. funnel coming up yeah. Yeah. and you might fall down that <laughs> funnel. Yeah. Yeah. What I'm pointing out is it's not just two-dimensional, there's also yeah. other dimensions. Yes. Yeah. In actual argument, yes. it's not just cognitive, it's also social and emotional. I absolutely agree with all that stuff. I just don't see that any of it's a case for prose as opposed to maps. I think uh, if, given that you have a lot of stuff to, to be able to, to have to cope with, why wouldn't you use all the representational resources that you have available to you? Why restrict yourself to a narrow set? Uh, so, uh, yeah, let's... I think some people believe that argument mapping might be just a business of symbols only without prose, but it might be sure. worth elucidating. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. So, so let me talk a little bit more about how argument mapping uh, starts to, to play out. Um, so okay, what would it look like if we took a graphic visual approach to the representation of argument as opposed to a prose approach? Well, that's argument mapping. We draw, we draw maps of arguments. Uh, next slide, please. Here's an argument map. I, I know you can't read the writing in the boxes. That's all right for the moment. This is a structured diagram. Remember Engelbart said uh, tree-like but not quite a tree? Well, this is, you can see this is tree-like, but I could explain why it's not exactly a tree. In fact, for technically, it's, a, it's, it's called a high graph structure. But, uh, but we use red blocks and green blocks, just like my Lego days, in, in this set of in this argument convention, in this set of conventions for argument mapping, I should say. Uh, you might say, oh, well, OK. Uh, this, gee, this looks complicated. This looks, you know, hmm. Yeah, it does, but compared with what I started with, which was a 50-page legal judgment where the actual argument was hidden in, in all that stuff, this is actually a way less complicated. It leaves out some stuff, I'll grant that. But it focuses on the core argument. And, and you can see, even without being able to read the stuff, you can understand some of the structure of the argument. The central, you know, the, the issue, the top level issue is this one. There's a top level argument here, supported by two, two arguments here, uh, and arguments beneath them. This objection is coming in and attacking that premise of this complex argument for that point. You can, you can see all that structure at a glance. It doesn't take any mental effort to see what the structure of the argument is. But if you represent the same stuff in prose, it, is, it requires how many years of education and law school and so forth to develop the skills required to be able to analyze text in this form. And, and, I, and it's very hard to do, and it's very problematic. It doesn't work very well. And I don't think there's anything, any technology that we use today that is as ancient and inefficient as the technology we use for the representation of argument. I stand by that bold claim. I think in every other area of life we've improved, except maybe procreation. But, well, in some ways, indeed, there's been some improvement there, but, uh, but not argumentation. We still handle arguments the same way that Plato and Aristotle did. And I think that's kind of weird. Uh, so, look, this is, a, this is a representation of argument map. Because this is just a diagram. I'm, you know, at one level, I'm saying diagrams are easier to understand than prose representations of the same information. But it starts to get really interesting when diagrams become interactive. See, what Engelbart was describing was not just a display, but the ability to manipulate the display, to interact with the display. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't plug my laptop um, to the computer. Uh, to the projector, so we can't actually see what it feels like to actually get in and be able to manipulate the structure. Uh, but that's really the essence. To me, the essence of argument mapping is not just the visual display of argument, but the ability to interact with argument in whole new ways because you've got the computer that supports the diagram. And so, you know, go back to the title of, of Engelbart's paper was called Augmenting Human Intellect. It's how do you make humans smarter? Well, you give them tools that complement their existing intelligence 
So the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And we do that in all kinds of ways. We do it already in all kinds of ways. I mean, it, you use Excel to help you with all the calculations around behind a business. That enables you to handle the business more intelligently than other ones. You and Excel, you know, Excel couldn't do it on its own, requires you. You couldn't do it on your own, requires Excel together. With the computer, it's not just Excel, you know, it's Excel plus a monitor, plus a mouse, plus etc. That whole package makes, is smarter than any of the components. And likewise, with argument mapping, when it comes to argumentation, it is possible to be smarter than it, you, you would or could be otherwise, than you would or could be when you're using what I would call inferior technology. Okay. So that's, that's the promise of argument, argument mapping. So, uh, yeah, back in, in 2000 and, and uh, early 2000s, I had a chance in California to, uh, to meet with Douglas Engelbart and say, look, 40 years later, we built it. You described it. We built it. This is uh, reasonable. Uh, a, uh, it's now sort of off the market uh, because it's been superseded by other software packages. But this is interacting with, with an argument mapping software package. You see the red box and green, green box. Uh, with a smart board so you can drag and drop with, you know, just by a little bit like, you know, it's sort of a, an early or sort of poor cousin of um, uh, the, the famous movie with Tom Cruise. I know. I know. Right? Uh, you know, but you know, the, the physical experience of manipulating argument structures on a smart board with appropriate technologies is really, um, it's, it's uh, thrilling, really, if, if you're interested in argument structures and complex argument. Uh, so, uh, so, look, it was great, uh, great pleasure indeed to be able to go and and and, uh, and show that, you know, the... Yeah. When you move, say, a green box onto a red box, yeah. what happens? And what do you, when you move a yeah. green box onto a green box, what happens? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I wish I could, I could uh, demonstrate uh, live, but... Um, so, corresponding to the, what we call the syntax, red box, green box lines, there's a semantic. So what does this mean? Um, and so basically, to, to have... A, uh, a green box under a green box means you've got one argument here for a proposition that's hidden behind my hand. And um, this is a supporting argument for that argument. So, so you've got a hierarchical structure. This on the hand is an objection to that argument. And you, you need to evaluate you know, which of these are, uh, are, are stronger. Uh, so um, it is, it, it wants, it, with a suitable tool, it becomes very drag and drop. Because arguments are uh, they're very hard to get right the first time. Complex arguments need to be worked and reworked and reworked until you're following suitable rules, rules of good argumentation, rules of logic in, in part, uh, until you've got, um, until you get it right. And that, that's, that's for everybody, it's not, um, not for people who are beginners, that's, you know, because no matter how good you are at this stuff, no matter how skilled you are with the tools, the arguments are actually always more complicated than you are. That, that is, uh, we're always trying to approximate a, a real grasp of the complexity of the, of, of the real issues. Um, so, so, where do you get, like, I mean, apart from legal, what other areas are you thinking of where you get the, 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 the argument complexity is, is great enough to... Just, uh, you know, but, uh, look, the, the most obvious one comes to mind is climate change, right? And, and debates about climate change, climate science, climate policy, Hugely complex, uh, and um, and and I would say to some to some degree, it's not certainly not the whole story, but to some degree, unresolved because people's minds can't get themselves around the complexity of the issues and the arguments. We struggle, and when you struggle, what happens is you just ignore stuff. You just you focus on certain things and neglect others. So in my view, climate skeptics are people who are by and large manage to maintain their, their own intellectual self-respect by focusing on certain arguments and ignoring others. And that's the natural thing that we all do when we're confronted with complex arguments. They just happen to be on the wrong side of the fence. Uh, for interesting reasons. Does um, your system allow people to go backwards to pick the conclusion, like for instance, um, climate change is absolutely does not exist, and then argue backwards to the roots or the reasons why that would be the case. Uh, look, 
<coughs> absolutely. In fact, the way we normally proceed, proceed in constructing new argument maps is to start with what we call the top level proposition. What, what's fundamentally at issue? Uh, that, um, that, that adaptation is preferable to mitigation, for example. Well, what arguments can we think of why that might be true? What arguments can we think of why that might be false? Once you've got your top level arguments, you think about, well, okay, here's an argument that appears to support that, but is it true? What arguments bear upon that? And so forth. And so you, you have this expanding hierarchy. That, that's an order of proceeding. It's not, you don't have to go that way, but it, it, it kind of is, is a, uh, a useful approach. So, uh, yeah, so that was one of the highlights of my career, really, was to take the tools and, and sort of, you know, show Engelbart. It's very, very, uh, very sweet. Man. For those who don't know the rest of the story, Engelbart went on to invent, you know, the mouse and Windows and hyperlinking and a whole lot of stuff that we all now use, because that got picked up by Stanford Research Institute, which got picked up by Apple, which got picked up by Windows, and now, well, where would we be without it? Right. He has ended up fundamentally transforming the way we think, the way we do intellectual work. That's what he set out to do. He did it. Yeah, how does that happen? It was fantastic. Uh, we all owe a huge debt uh, to, to this man. So uh, here's my fundamental proposition. It informs an argument. Argumentation can be complex. I've, I've emphasized that point already. We know in general. And so this is indisputably true, right? There's no doubt about that. Visualization enhances our capacity to cope with complexity. Does anybody disagree with that? In general, as a general statement. I think you've got to acknowledge that some people uh, absorb information in, in different ways from others. And um, some people can't read maps. You know. That's right, yeah. But uh, some people are blind and, and they can still take with arguments to a considerable yeah, yeah. degree. But generally, I agree with you, but yeah. there is some fuzz there. That's right. Um, yeah. But in general, as a, you know, to a first approximation, you know, this is true. We know from all sorts of examples that this, that this is true. This is just tautological visualization of argumentation. Well, that's what we mean by argument mapping. Therefore, argument mapping can enhance our capacity to cope with. Is there any flaw in that argument? <laughs> Uh, well, I think it's pretty good. I think some arguments don't lend themselves to visualisation, perhaps. Um, yet to find one, uh, and I've done thousands. Well, uh, simple, exist. extremely simple well, arguments. Exist. Extremely simple arguments you may not need to That's be right, mapped, and there's a level of um, complexity of like going through a, like a, a either a piece of software or for paper and pen to be able to represent arguments and yeah. these sorts of things. It's yeah. a, it may be even less cumbersome yeah. than writing things out as a big block of prose, yeah. but there right. is a level of complexity that people need yeah. to achieve in or get over in order to. Yeah, I mean, arguments. It's it, complexity. Arguments can be complex. So when arguments get complex, visualization mm -hmm. of arguments can comes into its own. Uh, now, Sorry, Meredith oh, had sorry. a point about God. Oh, well, have <laughs> yeah. you used it to um, uh, prove the argument right. <laughs> God doesn't exist or God does exist? Well, you know what? Um, prior to the 20th century when I get mapping was devised, there were, there were some hints of it in the 19th century, but, but it was only really in the 20th century, and only really indeed in the late 20th century that, that I get mapping really started to, to grow. The closest that anybody ever came to argument mapping was the, were the arguments of the medieval scholastic philosophers. Mm -hmm. People like Aquinas, right, who were trying to articulate arguments on precisely those sorts of questions. And doing so with such a degree of rigor, they were trying to spell out every step that, so that uh, the arguments could be absolutely solved. And um, they're almost at the point where you can simply transfer them over into a map. They've articulated the argument so well, but they were still in the prose form. And of course, they didn't have diagrammatic tools. They didn't have computers. And all so they were doing the best they could with very limited technology. So if we skip to the next. Without argument mapping, this is where you are. Right? This is, right? Trying to engage in complex argumentation without argument mapping is like you know, trying to get around on a tricycle that's too small for you. You can do it. But it's very inefficient. And you only get you so far. I think it's kind of a nice analogy. It's like trying to do, run a business without Excel. Uh, you know, it, it, that's from the perspective of someone who's sort of seen the power of the tools, what they can do. But of course, most people haven't. Most people have never experienced it. Uh, so there isn't much of it around. It isn't done much. 
right? Now, my consulting firm specialises, that's what we, it's, it's kind of bread and butter, it's that, that's the main tool that we use, uh, uh, apart from generic tools like you know, Word and things like that. But, um, <clears throat> but now I'm going to briefly, if I've got maybe five, ten minutes. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I actually want to um, confess that I'm now in a post-argument mapping phase. Oh, post-argument mapping phase. Um, that is like, uh, you know, up to now I probably sounded like I'm proselytising argument mapping because right? it's such great stuff and yeah, indeed I think, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot to it. But the reality is, uh, you know, people don't take to it. In all sorts of contexts, we've shown, you know, we've used argument maps with people, we've particularly in, in, uh, in teaching and, and uh, so forth. And, and the reality is that, uh, by and large, people don't gravitate towards it. They don't spontaneously use it. And, and part of, one reason is that no matter how good you make the tools, and we've tried to make tools as, as user-friendly as we can, it's actually hard work to actually map arguments, mapping arguments, because what arguments mapping does is it exposes the unclarity in your arguments. And once unclarity is exposed, it makes you feel uncomfortable. Argument mapping is like an acid test for the degree to which you understand what the arguments are. If you understand the arguments perfectly well, argument mapping is trivial. But it's almost always the case that you don't understand the arguments very well. So therefore, argument mapping is hard. And most people would prefer not to acknowledge the degree to which they don't actually understand the arguments. So argument mapping is it's like the... You know, uh, it makes itself unpopular. Kind of like UML in, in yeah. uh, the uh, computer science industry. Possibly, yeah. Um, you know, I was taught UML, I taught UML, and I've seen it about four times in industry, in the IT industry, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, it, it's, yeah. it's, it's the, the modeling language to use when representing uh, complex software architecture, yeah. but often things are just like uh, represented in like block diagrams or network diagrams or, or yeah. whatnot. So. Yeah. But we're very interested, despite this, we're still very interested in, yeah. I agree, absolutely. Um, we're very interested in improving public debate. Um, I'll just spend 30 seconds if I can on the next slide. Um, we've used argument mapping a lot in teaching reasoning skills to undergraduates. And lo lots of other people around the world have been doing studies. Every one of these dots represents a study done somewhere by, in teaching argument mapping, so teaching students critical thinking by teaching them argument mapping. And, and people are interested in the degree to which this enhances critical thinking skills. So you, you test the students before, you test them afterwards. Are they doing any better on the test? By how much are they doing better on the test? After a certain amount of argument mapping training. And uh, the, the overall result is represented by this blue line, about 0.57 standard deviation. That may not mean much, but this is what a over one semester. Over at university, typically, this is the gain you get. In other words, you're getting five times the gain in critical thinking skills over one semester if you, if you teach people critical thinking. Sorry, if you teach people argument mapping. A five-fold acceleration in argument mapping skills. Sorry, in critical thinking skills. Generic, transferable critical thinking skills if you, if you train them in argument mapping. Why is that? Because argument mapping gives them, for the first time, mental schemas to understand the structure of argument. And uh, arg the structure of argument is, is essential to critical thinking. Uh, and you can, if you're doing high intensity argument mapping training, you can get very, very substantial. This, that type of gain in critical thinking is more than students normally gain in critical thinking over an entire four year undergraduate degree. You can get that in one semester by training people in argument mapping. So in other words, you can, through my, the title of my talk was augmenting and enhancing human reasoning. Augmenting means using argument mapping like you're using Excel, we can do more than we could otherwise. Enhancing, I mean, we can make ourselves smarter, that is, we can make ourselves better reasoners by training ourselves in this skill. Even when you're not actually using argument mapping, you're just better, you know, you've you improved your brain uh, by internalising argument mapping structure. You're, you know, you literally visualise arguments. So, so when I'm re reading a book and I'm looking at arguments, I'm, you know, it's, it's now inside my head, right? I'm, I'm, to some extent, I can't do it as well as if I had the computer, but, but to some extent it, it's, it's gone inside the head. Anyway, people don't like it. So, um, so what we're doing now is um, uh, going back to a kind of a semi-structured uh, argumentation. One way to look at argument mapping is 
I, I call it semi-formal. On the one hand, you've got informal argumentation. There's argumentation in natural language. On the other hand, you've got formal logic. You can do some interesting things with formal logic, but you can't handle most interesting arguments about most real-world topics. It's just way too formal. Uh, in, in, informal argumentation is too informal, it's too sloppy, it's too partial, it's too, uh, you know, all sorts of problems. Is there a semi-formal sweet spot, somewhere between the way it's ordinarily done and formal logic? Argument mapping is an attempt to say, well, actually, maybe if we visually structure you know, in this way, maybe that's the, it, it's adding structure, but not so much structure, we're not making it purely symbolic. Uh, and um, and I, th I think there's really something there, but, but also somewhere in that spectrum of formality is uh, an alternative approach that we've been developing over the last couple of years. Uh, it's represented in uh, something we call uh, a platform that we call Your View. Okay, Australia, Canada should have a large, much larger population. A classic example of a, of a simple to state idea where, around which the argumentation is very complex right? uh, and people have strongly divergent views. How can we get some... What is the collective wisdom? What do we collectively think, taking into account all the arguments of that? Uh, how would you find out what our collective view? What is the collective wisdom? Your view platform is trying to do that. It, it, can we scroll down a bit? Okay. Um, you can see here a set of arguments, population growth for will help the economy in the short term. That's an argument for having a bigger population. Hey, it'll help the economy. And here's an informal presentation of that argument. And on the other hand, there are arguments on the other side as well. Right. And if we scroll down further, uh, people can, uh, a bit further, uh, vote on the argument. I'm not signed in, so I can't vote at the moment. But you know, you can vote on the argument, and uh, you get a raw vote. You also get a kind of an augmented raw vote, which we call the collective wisdom. Uh, won't go into all the details of how that's done. If you scroll further, people can uh, comment um, and and reply and rate each other's comments and all that sort of stuff. And um, now, uh, if if we go back up, I want to actually now just show the similarity between this and argument mapping. Yep. Yep. Just there a bit. Um, right here, population growth will help the economy in the short and the long term. Do you see this bar graph here? It's showing 93% opposed. Actually, we only have a limited user set here, so don't worry about the numbers in particular. But is that true, that population will help the economy in the short term? Well, that's a matter for dispute. It's a matter of debate. So we actually, you know, these arguments all pertain to the top level proposition, we should have a bigger population. There's another set of arguments that pertain to whether or not it will help the economy. So let's, if we can from that, we drill, we drill down into that. And we see, uh, scrolling down, we see the same structure, sets of arguments, and people can vote and comment. And we get the collective wisdom at that level, and we import it back up to where we were. If we go back, let me go back. Uh, that's the collective wisdom at the lower level on the truth of that proposition. And you can see that for all of these arguments. And so you can iterate this as much as you like. So here's a way of integrating the collective wisdom on all sub-issues and pulling them together into a higher level collective judgment as to whether we should or shouldn't have uh, a higher population. Now, if you take whole sets of issues, I mean, population is just one. We're coming into an election. So how many issues are there in the election? Carbon tax. 457 visas, um, you know, parental leave, etc., etc. Well, we've got a list. There are 37 at the moment, 37 issues in play in the election. And that's probably not all. Okay. Where, you know, what do we think? What's the collective wisdom right across all those issues as to who we should vote for? How would we figure that out? Well, let's go across to the other table. And uh, scroll up on the other. Uh, no, sorry, the first one, first tab. Okay, each one of these dots represents somebody who has participated in a forum and voted on some number of these 37 different issues. Uh, we've got the Greens, Labor, Liberals, Nationals. So this is a 2D space. It's a reduction of the 37 degree similarity space, you know, when you compare across each of the different issues. 
these are actually dummy users mostly, so the distribution is fairly, fairly uh, um, you know, uh, even. But, uh, but right in the middle here, we can see the collective wisdom is this red dot, slightly different to the popular vote. In other words, this is actually collapsing um, across all these different issues, across all these different users, trying to figure out what collectively we think is the right answer to this question of who you should vote for. Now, this, this data is, as I said, it's, it's actually um, auto-generated data, so it's not surprising, it's pretty much sort of right in the middle, right? But, uh, but you get the idea. Uh, so, based on an argument mapping structure, we can engage large numbers of people into a debate where we actually get a, collect, a coherent collective answer and we can visually display that. And by changing these sliders, I can, you know, if, if the environment's really important as opposed to politics, let's say, well, you'll get a slightly different similarity space. You might end up closer to one party as opposed to another, because right? you can find yourself, of course, on this. Part of the idea is you can, you know, you vote a certain way, maybe you're here, maybe you're here. I mean, who knows where they are on this map across 37 issues? Well, until you use tools like this, you, it's difficult to find out. And what we hope to reveal is that there's a fair degree of misalignment. And there's people who think actually they're, you know, all my life I've been a Labour voter, but if they actually knew what all the issues were and where they stood on all the issues and how that compares with the platforms of all the parties on all those issues, they might find out that actually they're somewhere over here. To, to the extent that people are misaligned, that misalignment can potentially be addressed by revealing the information. Uh, so, so this is what we're currently doing in what we might broadly call sort of the argument mapping uh, sort of space. Can I ask, um, is there a way that you can sort of distill uh, the arguments of the population into an argument map that's, I guess, inferentially designed. And there's some advanced mapping that you that we've talked about before, which allows for inference instead of just um, straight, you know. Uh, yeah. So if we go back to the previous tab, um, you you actually see that it, in a uh, sort of scrolling down, this actually corresponds to a red box, green box argument map, where there's a sort of structural correspondence. It's just we're not using boxes and lines and arrows and it's not quite as reduced down to its bare structure as in a classic argument map. But there's definitely a, a correspondence. It, you could say it is an argument map, just you know, using a different set of conventions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So the different degrees of granularity at which you can do argument mapping. And uh, for, for complex legal arguments particularly, you really have to go a level, a finer level of granularity than this to really adequately represent the structure, what's really going on uh, with the arguments. So, so part of your presentation, there's a bit of a notion that we're trying to come up with a right answer, yeah. but that's not even necessarily the case. Just even illuminating the different arguments and how they relate and their underpinning arguments and so forth yeah. is often just part of the exercise. Okay, we yeah, understand your argument and all its yeah. underpinnings. Yeah. We don't agree because we think this or that, but now we get you. Yeah. No, no, before you were just a bit of a crackpot, but now at least we sort of get where you're coming from. That's right. Um, so if we scroll down a bit to the comments section, um, you're sort of right, but I also want to be a little bit, um, you know, take a slightly strong stand, which is, what's the point of illumination? What's the point of me understanding you? At the end of the day, why do we need that? Why do we care? So we don't beat each other up. So we don't beat each other And, and we actually collectively find out what really we, we've got to do. But that's the point of it all. For me, it's like, how are, we going, how are we going to save, coming back to the Engelbart thing, how are we going to save our skids, right? Uh, I mean, climate change is only one of what I call the seven horsemen of the apocalypse that are coming upon us, right? And how are we going to uh, actually save humanity in the face of this? Well, we have to take action. What action? Well, we have to collectively decide what is the right action to take. And I don't think we've got adequate mechanisms for collective uh, decision making and for collective um, uh, truth seeking. Uh, and, and so ultimately, a lot of the time, it just gets resolved through a vote. Through, through imperfect argument, but we put it to a vote and we accept that in a democratic society, we put it to a vote and the majority wins. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, look where that's gone. I mean, a fair, yeah. a fair yeah. way, it's been all yeah. the way through. We see democracy yeah. probably as one of the pinnacles of societal development over the last Yeah, we tend to. Years. We tend to. And, 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 that, and, and, and what, what the next, next natural step is, is sort of thinking that democracy as we have is all kind of fine and, and it's the best way there is and don't mess with it, which I think is actually just as dangerous as the reverse. I mean, I'm a dem I believe in democracy. It's just that we've got to fix it. And how do we fix it? Well, you know, what are practical methods? What realistically, how, what can we do about it? As opposed to just dreaming about some perfect democracy that we don't have and we'll never will have. Oh, and, uh, and I sort of come from that school a little bit. A, a counterpoint to that part of the debate, an extreme log logical argument is the way to win the day. Let's take a, a different debate. Yeah. Um, goes on in the United States more than it does here, the right to teach creationism on an equal footing as a scientific theory to evolution. The other side is not arguing nationally. They don't want sure. to be involved. Look, we believe yeah. we have faith. Yeah, so there's, there's certain overlap, I think, between the point that you're quite, quite rightly making and the point that was being made before, is that argumentation is, is a, there's a whole lot more involved in argumentation than, than sort of pure rational argument. I absolutely agree with that. Uh, but that does not just mean there isn't an element of pure rational argumentation and that we need to be as good on that score as we can. Um, I'm, I'm conscious that there's another, another talk coming up, so I'd, I'd like to make a point about this, which I think is probably going to lead into this next, uh, next uh, talk about negotiation. So you'll, you'll see these uh, next to these, uh, use, these uh, comment title, username, and a number here, 8.7. What does that mean? Uh, that's a score that the platform assigns to the user. So you see Lindy Penguin here has got a score of 50.1. That's, in, our, in this system, that's huge. She's one of the top players. Um, this is what we call credibility. The platform calculates your credibility. Yeah, it's a little bit controversial. Um, but, um, but credibility is a measure of the degree to which you have been a thoughtful and constructive participant in the debate in the forum. And we're, we're using quite a bit of data to try and calculate credibility. But let me say, the, the most effective way as a participant in the forum to build your credibility is to write comments which are positively received by high credibility people who disagree with you. Not much use writing stuff that appeals to people who agree with you. That does not advance collective wisdom very much. If you can craft your point so that you earn the respect, if not the agreement, of people who disagree with you, right, then you get rewarded highly in this system. And so I agree absolutely. There's all sorts of emotion and politics and, and uh, uh, all sorts of stuff that, that uh, clouds our pure argumentation. But we can use suitable tools to try to counteract the, the influence of those things. So, so, so we assign these credibility scores. And, to, and uh, if you look on the platform at the people who have high credibility, you will see that their contributions to the forum are far more thought, well thought out, far more reasonable. They're not trolling or inflaming. They're not, uh, you know, they're not extremists. They, they're taking account of the arguments on their side. Um, than uh, you know, all the epistemic virtues that we try to teach undergraduates you know, in, in arts degrees, right? they're reflecting those virtues and they're getting rewarded for it. And so then those credibility weightings are what we use to calculate the collective wisdom. That is, we take the raw vote on an issue and we multiply it by the credibility of the participants. So in other words, if you've earned credibility on the site, you get a slightly, well, a significantly, depends on the credibility score, um, st uh, stronger influence on what the, cre the collective wisdom is. Okay. So that's, that's why we purport to call it collective wisdom. It's like giving the people who have actually you know, thought more carefully about this stuff a little bit more say. And wouldn't you want to do that? And the people who just haven't, they don't know much about it, they're just flaming away. You just want to say, well, okay, you can have your vote, but we're not going to weigh it very much. That's the premise here, is, is that in a liberal democracy, that's what we ought to be doing. And that's what the platform builds in. So, um, 
So it's almost a, you know, you dress it up, a calculus of opinion or a calculus of argument. Yeah, and, and I firmly believe that on certain kinds of questions, the only path that we have to the truth of the matter on those questions is the collective rational consensus of large numbers of people, all of whom have different perspectives and interests and different arguments. If we can somehow aggregate all that in the right way, we have no better path. We have no other way of knowing what is the truth. Should we have more large dams in Australia? Should we or shouldn't we? What's the truth of that? How would you know? What's the mechanism for establishing the truth? I would say, practically speaking, there isn't one. That's what we're trying to build here, is, is a platform big enough and robust enough and sensitive enough that it can discern collective wisdom of large numbers of participants. Yeah, so, so if we use Copernicus in the Flat Earth as an example, Copernicus. Well, you know, precisely what we're trying to do is, is, is counteract, is, is if there's a, a minority opinion, which is nevertheless well argued, that ought to be able to get, get recognition. So all, all um, the experts of the day, not yeah. just the religious people, would say, no, you're wrong. Yeah. And because he had no credibility, he'd never win. Uh, look, you know, there's probably other counter examples that I could find in science. Even yeah, Einstein right. Had trouble with but, but notice what you're picking out there. I mean, rightly, it's, it's an interesting point, but you're picking out an extreme case yeah. where only one person has has actually seen the truth. In in normal, like if we take the hard issues in front of us, should we have more big dams? Should, yeah, you know, should we? Yeah. You know, we, it's actually the argument's already out there, mostly. But it's a matter of how we come to collective, you know, rational consensus <coughs> about the weight of those arguments. So it's, it's predicated on an informed populace? To, uh, yes, but less so than traditional democratic mechanisms. Uh, there's, we don't, you know, in, in a kind of, this kind of platform, you don't need everybody to be well informed. So, so in one sense, in society, we already have a, um, a lot of technical arguments and acceptance by society that those who are the technical experts get more say and get more heard than the lay person. But on the other hand, if you tried to tell people in general, your vote's discounted because you're a numpty, <laughs> you're going to have big arguments and fights just about that. No, no, okay, if, 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 we, if I was, actually, if you scroll up a little bit. Yep. Uh, oh, oh, there, just that's, show, click on see results. Um, see results. Uh, in the middle of the screen. Uh, see results. Oops, what happened there? Is that it? Uh, no, um, we just click on... Oh, there it is, yeah, this is it. Okay, this is the raw vote. This is the one person, one vote. This is classic online polling. You know, uh, if that's what you want, where everybody gets an equal say, yeah. there's your number. Right. If you're interested in the opinion of those people who actually are more thoughtful about and you know, more capable of rational deliberation about these issues, that's your number, your choice. You know, wisdom leader. It's a wisdom leader. That's, that's what we're trying to build here. Uh, so look, this is going uh, uh, live in end of um, July with a major media organisation. It's going to be integrated into election coverage. So um, all going well. We'll actually have really large scale participation in this. We'll get an insight into what the collective wisdom of a large, not all Australians obviously, but, but you know, large chunks of Australians actually is, as compared with the kind of number you get from the polls on issues. Right, which is just a snapshot of, it, of people's opinion, no matter how well thought out, no matter how well informed those opinions actually are. That'll be interesting, to get something, an alternative way of seeing what the people think to so traditional polls. It's not live yet. Uh, this, this is live in the sense that um, some parts of it are live, but the election form and this visualisation is not live yet. Uh, sure. uh, it's working, but it's not, hasn't been uh, unveiled. What is interesting is that the against is almost exactly the same for the votes and the collective wisdom. Uh, yes, but in this case, on this issue has, is, is a demonstration issue. It doesn't have proper participation. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> Over time, yeah. Okay. I've taken up too much time, speaking of time. Uh, so, uh, thanks for letting me preach on. Thank you very much.